All right. Well, welcome to another ADHC talk. It's Friday morning at about 11. And today I am joined by Amanda Ko, who is a chemical engineer who designs wearable devices. Um, so welcome, Amanda. I'm going to read a little bit about, about you and then you and I are going to have a really fun talk. Um, so Dr. Amanda Ko completed her PhD in chemical engineering at Rensler, Rensler I don't know how Rensselaer. to say it. Rensselaer. <laughs> yeah. um, Still have trouble remembering how to, how to spell it. So Yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> it, it's a French word. Um, Polytechnic Institute, <laughs> and her BS is from MIT. Uh, her research group focuses on engineering multifunctional materials through intentional design of interfaces. Current research focuses on materials for soft robotics, stretchable electronics, sensing, and environmental remediation. <clears throat> Amanda is an assistant professor at the University of Alabama, and she's currently a fellow um, with the Collaborative Arts Research Initiative, CARI, which is one of the ways that I found her. So welcome, um, Amanda, to Thank the you. world of humanities, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> digital humanities specifically. And I'm going to go ahead and ask you our first question. Um, so many of us wear devices that help us measure our biometric data. I wear a Fitbit and it definitely helps me stay grounded. Um, it reminds me to get up and move. It helps me be aware of my stress level. Um, and it helps me with time management. I can <clears throat> be very poor with my time management. I get some hyper-focus and lose track of time. Sometimes I forget to eat or I forget to go home in the afternoon sometimes. So my Fitbit definitely helps me with those things. Um, and I'm just curious, how did you become interested in designing wearable devices? And what are some of your, the previous devices that you've worked on or have made? Yeah, so wearable devices are really interesting because I think when you first think of them, like, you know, Fitbit comes to mind. There's even like, you know, there's T-shirts that maybe have some something that comes against your chest. Maybe it's a like response to kind of your temperature. I mean, wearable sensors, you can even think about like, like a mood ring, right? You know, it responds to the temperature of your body. These are all things that sense something about you, something about kind of who you are, what, how you, your, your current state. But the things that are currently out there have a lot of challenges. I mean, even thinking about kind of, even you know, in the last few years, how well like the iPhone has done and kind of picking up your emotion or how good Fitbits have kind of gotten over their lifetime. It's not easy to be good at being a wearable device. You know, maybe there's, you know, a motion of just up and down. So they can detect something about kind of changes in, in like gravitate your gravitational motion, essentially. But if we're trying to get kind of more fine-tuned understanding of your body, particularly things we're thinking about like medical responses or medical devices, um, things that can really not just say gross understanding of, of your body, but fine movements, things that can help you biologically, things that can help you biochemically, things that really have fine understanding of, of kind of who you are and what how your body moves is something that's really still being developed. And what's really exciting when I kind of got into, I started doing some stuff like this in my postdoc. So I wrote a postdoc with the Army Research Lab, and that's where I kind of got into the world of soft robotics and, and, and special electronics and things like that. And this idea of being using soft materials rather than you know, your Fitbit is made out of copper and you know this hard shell and things like that. And that's good enough to kind of sit on your wrist. But if you wanted something that can detect as you're moving, you know, you're you're stretching, you're deforming, you need a material that's going to move with you. But how do you kind of get that and still have all the kind of electrical, you know, your computer is all really hard stuff. How do you kind of get the best of both worlds? How do you hopefully do both? And you get kind of the electrical impulses, the ability to sense, but still have a material that can move like you are. I mean, think of your skin. Your skin is really good at stretching. Your skin is really good at moving. Your skin is good at kind of, as you're going, it goes with you. A Fitbit can't do that. An iPhone can't do that. You know, your t-shirt, at least like the thing that's in, I remember maybe when I was in college, it was really big to get these t-shirts that like, you know, turn, turn, made sounds or turn colors or something based on kind of where you were. Like that can't do that fine grain understanding. And it really takes understanding soft materials the electronics and the mechanical part pieces of it in order to do that. And there's a lot of really interesting examples kind of that are on the 
edge of being commercialized. You know, glucose sensors are a really big thing right now, um, where they're able to detect things about your body you know, really biochemically, and not only detect them, but be able to kind of give you, you know, a dose of, uh, of you know, insulin or something like that on its own. So you don't have to take out kind of an insulin shot or things like that. There's, I, I got to really do a deep dive into that. I, I got an opportunity to write a book chapter about kind of wearable, like biochemical sensors and stuff. There's all kinds of really cool stuff out there. And I'll say, when I think about wearable, I really do think about like, um, like a, a glove or a garment or something like that. And I'll talk about that in a second, but there are some really interesting wearable stuff. And wearable could be like a contact lens, could be, you know, something that goes on your teeth and it responds to something in your saliva or it responds to something kind of in your tears. Um, there's things like, you know, making bandages that have some sort of sensor in them so that they can actually deliver, you know, drugs or things like that based on the, you know, the temperature or, you know, particular biomolecules that show that something is going wrong. Uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff out there. So for me, I, I, I like to, you know, what am I interested in? And I want to actually do something useful. Like I want to do something good for, for the world, not just, you know, sit in my lab and just play with toys, which is fun. Like it's definitely one of the reasons to become an engineer, but I want to make sure that we're helping you know, humanity. That's very uh, Miss America kind of answer. But um, when <laughs> I look at kind of being interested in, in soft materials and these soft electronics, how can we make sensors that conform to the body, understand the body, help us understand the body? And particularly what I was interested in is really trying to get kind of the blending of sensitivity and signal. So there's a lot of stuff out there uh, that either Think of like your your if you weigh yourself, it's a scale. You step on it, it tells you how much you weigh. And it's it's pretty good at, you know, once you're above a certain weight, it can tell you with some amount of accuracy. But it's not telling you kind of really, you don't need the like nth decimal place. If you, I, I don't care that I'm some number of point seven 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 pounds. Like that's un, 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 not useful. There's also people who are working on super, super sensitive things. So think about kind of putting, you can take your finger and you can kind of, my hands tend to be really dry. So I can put a finger kind of over my, my palm and I can feel every little bump. I can feel kind of the texture of my skin, things like that. There, there are people who are working on sensors that are really good on that end of it as well. I'm really interested in how do you do both? How do you get kind of these gross, these larger kind of measurements, but still get kind of those fine details? Because one of the reasons that I kind of first started thinking about this is that I was looking at uh, sensors you can put in the soles of your shoes, for example. So something that uh, can detect that you're standing up or how you're walking or things like that. And that exists like there are commercialized versions of that they're usually pretty expensive and they're usually kind of restricted to like uh, occupational therapy or things like that um but they, they do exist what i was interested in is how do we kind of use those sensors to not necessarily predict but see as you are getting injured or maybe as you're recovering kind of that slow descent into something being wrong and that's not something that's going to be a big change in, you know, I weigh this much versus this much, or, you know, I can't stand up versus I can. It can, you know, as you're aging, or maybe as you're recovering from a stroke or something like that, those small changes in how you're getting better, we're not able to capture that right now. Because not only does it have to be my whole body measurement, but it has to be those kind of fine changes of if I'm standing, you know, if I'm a healthy person, I should be able to stand with equal balance over, over both of my feet, kind of distributing my weight. And it should be kind of fairly evenly distributed over my feet. How do I tell that, you know, I'm slightly leaning this way or I'm leaning forward or how does that change kind of based on a certain stimuli? That was something that was really interesting to me, in particular uh, from the beginning that I did my postdoc with the military. There's a lot of when you come back, come back to service or think of, you know, being at UA, big thing, you come, you're back on the field, for example, you get injured and you want to get, you want to be back on playing or you want to be back on your role kind of as quickly as possible. And it's up to usually an occupational therapist or something like that to say whether you're, you're good or not. And First of all, that takes a ton of experience. Yeah, you know, not only just kind of your degree, but the time you take to kind of learn how to look at that. But it's very difficult to get that last, you know, five, ten percent. You know, you're you're really all the way. Certainly, you can tell, you know, from injured to some amount. But that last five or ten percent can still make the difference between whether you have to come back or not. Do you get re-injured because you weren't a hundred percent, you were ninety percent, or something like that? And maybe for me that doesn't matter because I spend most of my time in the lab or walking around. But if I'm going to be on a football field and people are smashing into me at real, really big people are smashing you really fast, that last ten percent can matter. Or if I'm a soldier in the field and I have to, you know, carry an enormous amounts of, of weight, you know, so how do we detect kind of those last bits, the last stages of of kind of getting better? So that was one of the things that really interested me at first in terms of wearable sensors and, and using kind of these soft materials, trying to understand kind of the electronics of them. Um, it's funny because I, I definitely took physics my freshman year of college and was like, I'm done. I'm never going to do this again. Like, And then, nope. 
<laughs> that was not the case. <laughs> um, came back and decided to do not just my postdoc, but my uh, faculty position that dealing with kind of electron electronics and EM and things like that. And then, so I always kind of interested in how these soft materials can help people. And I, I say this a lot for kind of all of my projects is that I, I never try to be a solution in search of a problem. I want to make sure that we have kind of what the what the what the problem is in mind as we're kind of do, making our material and making our sensors. And part of Cary, before I actually joined Cary, there was a, like a coffee lab. And I was talking to two of these professors, you know, and they said they were they were interested in, in uh, their, they were vocal professors at different departments. And they were interested in basically seeing, you know, they spend a lot of time with their students, teaching them how to breathe in a certain way, breathing that's appropriate for a singer. Um, and there was all kinds of interesting conversations that we had about what that means, uh, which is something I was not aware of at all. Um, but again, this kind of, it was similar to the occupational therapist was that they required a lot of experience. They had to look at the person. They had to constantly know, this is where you need to be changing. This is not expanding enough. You're kind of, this needs to be, and they had so much knowledge of anatomy. It was, they were, they were, I mean, they are, they still, they're still working with me. They're amazing in kind of what they're doing. But it was a lot. It was very laborious. And it's also on the student side, you kind of just have to understand what it is the teacher is talking about and, and you know, internalize what it means that you need to expand more versus versus contract or move or something like that. So they were talking to me, is there a way to quantify that? And, you know, I, I say particularly as the, my generation slash certainly the next generation, when I see like a video game, like, okay, I need it to be 10. And if I get to 10, then I get the, you know, the next level or something like that. So give me a number and then I can try to achieve that number and I'll do kind of whatever it needs. So is there something we could do about, you know, changing your breathing behavior? And this is not kind of how they put it, but that, yeah, I think about things in terms of numbers and video games and things like that. Now, how do you give me kind of a number to achieve? And then I can figure out what I need to do that. So is there a way to quantify essentially this kind of breathing motion, this breathing behavior? Uh, so that's kind of led to this, this mixture between kind of the vocal and music and, and sensing is that if we can put something where if it's a, if it's a mechanical movement, it's an expansion or a contraction, we can measure that. We can take our sensors, these kind of deformable, these kind of stretchable materials and put it on the body. And how we put it on the body is, an interesting question on its own, um, but basically, how do we detect that your that your chest is expanding or contracting, or that your posture isn't very good? And maybe those are kind of simpler simpler ones. You know, how much is it expanding or contracting? But all along the torso, you know, all the different pieces of your anatomy, you know, the sides of your anatomy, things like that. We can kind of put these sensors and hopefully extract numbers of like this is how much this is where you are now. This is how where you were maybe when you first started. This is the trend that you're making. Maybe you can think about you know exercises you did or practices you had that worked and practices that didn't based on kind of you can see where your numbers are changing or not I think it's really powerful to be able to quantify at how your performance is changing essentially that's kind of how I ended up in this particular project but there's so much just kind of wearable stuff that's interesting out there um I, I think there's a lot of really interesting work now of how do we translate it to being useful you know, a lot of people have made interesting materials and certainly I will continue to make interesting materials but how do we make it so that you know, someone in the humanities or someone in music is can use it. You know, it's not just uh, there's like a really classic picture of a grad student's like finger in a, in a paper where they have like a sensor right here. Like, look, they can do that and then detect it, which I mean, <laughs> is good, but like that's not getting us anywhere right now. So how do we kind of make that next step? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Like as you're talking, I'm thinking like all of the spy craft movies that I've ever watched. <laughs> and I also am thinking a lot about like Octavia Butler's Xenogenesis series. I don't know if you've ever read those, but like just the when you talk about like our skin as sensors or our, our skin as wearable devices or like comparing them to our skin or our anatomy, like like what what you get to work on is like bringing to life all of this sci-fi fiction that we've read all of all sure. you know for fun and I just think that's that's just like such a dream job to even be able to know how to do that I, um I, so you've spoken a little bit about your current project already mm -hmm. about the wearable device for breathing um so I guess I want to know more specifically, like, what are you hoping to measure uh, and how does that even work? Um, how are the sensors that you're working on worn and um, what kind of sensors are they? Like, what does that even mean? 
<laughs> you know, because you say that like there's a lot of different kinds of sensors. Yeah. So like what what are they and what are they measuring and how how do you put them together in order to correspond with each other and come out with a reading? Yeah, so I'll I'll start kind of the the thing that my my lab are like bread and butter kind of thing is making something called dielectric material. Dielectric material is part of a capacitor. So capacitor is one of these kind of fundamental uh, units of a of a circuit. And I am again remembering that uh, physics from ENM not was, wasn't my favorite thing in the world, but you know now I'm actually going back to it. So I don't pretend to be an electrical engineer, but the the basics you have resistor, capacitor, inductor. You have you know all all these sorts of things. Um, so we focus on the capacitor. We focus on the dielectric material. The capacitor is really simple. It has you know a top plate and a bottom plate that are both conductive and something in material that between that's a dielectric material. You put okay. kind of uh, a field across this. The dielectric material polarizes. So you think of kind of pieces, uh, molecules in the dielectric material will respond to the field and orient in a certain way. And that's how you can store power. And that's kind of our story electricity. I want to be careful. Right. I mean, you're talking about back to the future at the moment, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, that's what I'm seeing is the flux capacitor, like storing yeah, energy jiggle and up. moving yeah. through time, right? Yeah, the jiggle, which is pretty sure. I think every, everyone <laughs> you say when your kid is gigawatts and that's really gigawatts, it's like, wow, well, who made this decision to like, say it this way uh but yeah um but so we, we make this material that goes in between the conductive plates essentially and, and trying to make it uh polarize better um and there's a lot of materials out there that can do this there's a lot of ceramic materials that can do this but ceramics oh. are hard ceramics are rigid um that doesn't really do it for us you know if we want to have something that's deformable with the body so we want to have a polymer polymer being this kind of soft stretchy material oh. um but polymers on their own uh, there's something called permittivity, which is like how good essentially the dielectric material is, and we want the permittivity to be as high as possible. And most polymers are like two, maybe they're three. And there's not you can change the chemistry of the polymer. You can know they're basically this number, and there's not a lot you can do to that. What we do is we mix things into the polymer, making a composite to increase that permittivity without having to change anything about the chemistry. And what my what I did in my postdoc and kind of what our power zone is, is actually using liquid metal. Uh, so we use a metal that is liquid at room temperature. Going back to the sci-fi, think uh, Terminator 2, the like metal guy, that's that's what we're working with. We cannot do that. If we could do that, uh, <laughs> my career, I, I could just retire now. Um, but we're able to basically mix this liquid metal into it and we increase the permittivity. We make it more sensitive. We're able to kind of respond to these fields better. So we take that material and it doesn't have to be liquid metal. It can be any kind of other conductive materials, things like that. We can basically, again, blend the keeping it soft while keeping it kind of electrically interesting. And, and we're very good at doing that, understanding kind of the trade-offs and, and tuning those two things. Um, and liquid metal is interesting because how much do you want to use it? It's fairly expensive. So when we kind of think about this as a real final application, we have always have to think about what our filler is. But we take that, we make that dielectric material. And essentially the way you actually make this a sensor is that capacitance, the kind of what a what we can read, you know, things like an ohmmeter or a multimeter, kind of things that maybe you know, like an electrician can 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 have, you know, always has in their back pocket, um, is based on how thick the material is. So if I have this plate and this plate, even if the material in the middle is the same, this has one capacitance and this has another capacitance. Just how what the distance is between the two plates. And if I take a material and I stretch it, it gets thinner. If I take a material and compress it, it gets thinner. So you can say what the change in capacitance is, is directly related to how much it's stretched or how much it compressed. So and we can make kind of calibration curves. We do all kinds of stuff with this material. Basically, it's just to say, if you, if you stretch it 20%, we know what that number should be. If you stretch it 40%, we know what that number should be. So if I take, going back to the classic kind of grad student example, if I take something and kind of put it over my knuckle, I, it'll stretch as I'm moving. And I can say basically how much it had to stretch, how much your finger moved, Based on the difference in the capacitance, so this is a it's a capacitive pressure capacitive pressure sensor, capacitive tensile sensor. Tensile being stretching, pressure being uh, compressing. Does that make sense, kind of so far? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm glad. So that's that's kind of the the bones of it is that this is it's responding to either compression or tension or something like that, and it either it compresses or it does something kind of changing that thickness. So the interesting question that you asked though is how do we actually wear it? Uh, because putting it on the body, I'm not just gluing things to you. <laughs> uh, people don't tend to want that. Uh, even 
Uh, there is actually a lot of work in, I don't know if you've done like EEG or EKG or things like that, the like nasty wet things you have to put on you and they clip stuff on. Like that's unpleasant. It's also not very robust. Like it move, like you can't do anything while you're doing that. It's yeah. gross because you'll have to wash all that stuff off. Like I, I've had to do a lot of like heart monitoring and stuff. And it's, it's, you just go home and you're like, we want to take a shower, getting all that stuff off of you. Um, so how do we do it where you can get kind of motion and things on the body without having to have kind of that wet connection? So what we're, we're actually trying to figure out what the best way is to, what the, what the garment, so we're going to put on a garment, essentially. What does that garment need to look like in order to best move with the body? And what fabric, is, so the, it's gone and it's very, like, going back to kind of, it, it started with art and then went to engineering and it's kind of going back to art as well. It's how do we kind of make something, how do we make a, how do we construct a garment that can do that the best? And I actually really like to sew. So I was really excited. We actually brought a sewing machine for the lab and we've been using it to make, it was, it's like one of my career goals is to build this, like <laughs> actually have a research sewing machine. Uh, but we actually started collaborating or working with someone in uh, our dance costume. Uh, I don't know if it's costume department, but she did, works on Tiffany Yeager. Um, so she does costumes for ballet where, you know, they have to stick with you. These people have crazy amounts of movement and they're doing all kinds of stuff. And she's really excited to work with us and say, okay, how do we make something that can be worn on the body and that basically... The idea is as I'm breathing, the garment will expand with my breath. And as I'm moving, the garment will expand basically at, that the fabric will move with whatever I'm doing. And how, the next question, like once you have that garment, how do we put the sensors on it such that the sensors will also move with the fabric? And these are kind of surprisingly different questions. Um, even just kind of taking our material and, and taking our dielectric or our sensors and putting it on fabric has been an interesting challenge. Um, our initial material we worked with was a, a polymer based on silicone. And the most common thing that people will think of silicone is it's a lubricant, you know, it's really slippery. Really slippery means that it's not good to glue things to it. <laughs> um, so it's funny, even these kind of like classic, this will glue everything, nope, does not work. So how do you actually stick that to the fabric? We actually had to, we've now transitioned to a slightly different polymer, different soft material, which kind of just melt into the fabric and you know, fabric is a weave, right? It has pores. So if you just kind of melt into it, it fills those pores and will kind of stretch with the fabric to some extent. It seems like that's been working, which is nice. So I have one really good undergraduate student, Gabrielle Motley, who has, she's a Randall scholar, so all kinds of good research stuff. And she's been working hard and really trying to figure out how we can put these materials on the fabric. And then as we stretch it, does it stay actually stretching with the fabric? Does it not delaminate or kind of like peel off? But she's kind of figured out maybe a system that works with that. The fabric, I think we're ending up using uh, Tiffany gave us a whole bunch of different fabrics, basically like different types of spandexes, spand spandexes, whatever the plural of spandex would be. Um, everything from uh, this really open weave to like compression sock kind of type of material. Um, yeah. And Gabriela fig like, figured out how to kind of put this on, we think in a fairly robust way. So now she's actually going to go back and actually try and make the garment. And I think that we're looking at now, and I think maybe because we are a team of, of largely women, women of different sizes, women of different backgrounds, it's important even now to kind of start, if we want this to be something that can be useful for people doing any kind of breathing behavior, it should fit everybody. It's not something that's going to fit one body type. It's not going to fit, you know, one height, one, one, uh, anything what your body looks like. We want to make sure that this is going to be useful for anybody. Um, and it's funny because even on the, even on our, I have three undergrads who are working on this with me, which they've all been really great. And even between them, we have very different body types, different heights, things like that. Um, uh, as in Jor Jordan and Anthony, Jordan Evans and Anthony Joyce, so they get a shout out as well. Um, <laughs> they've all been trying to keep in mind, how do we put this, how do we make it so it's not just like a tube and it only works for one one person. So we're right. thinking kind of like black jacket kind of thing where it it ha it goes over your head and maybe like snaps or, or has something tied down the side. So you can make kind of different height, different widths of it. It's probably gonna still have a couple different sizes. The thing is that we're interested in, in when I talked to kind of to the vocal professors, uh, they were interested in all these kind of different locations on the body. And someone who's, you know, 5'1", if I put a sensor here, and then someone who's 6'1", I put a sensor here, it's in a different place on their body. <laughs> and you're not necessarily going to get the same measurement. So how do we kind of figure out on these different sizes, where do those sensors need to go? So that, that's kind of the next step in, in the work, is that once we have a garment that does seem to kind of expand and contract and move with the person, what is it? where do the sensors need to go in order to kind of get all the data that we want? 
And I mean, for from an academic side, we could just put sensors everywhere, you know, they could just be covered in these types of materials. Um, and maybe that's what we start with first and then kind of take things off as they don't end up being useful. Uh, but the hope certainly, and I think this is, you know, we're talking about your five-year plan, your 10-year plan, whatever. I think this is a reasonable, you know, next five years for this to be a commercially translatable product. Um, which means that we do we do want to have strategically have placed these sensors kind of where you're going to get the best and, and most useful information. Right. Um, right. But that's that's kind of where this is, is going. Um, I, I'll say that. So this was this was inspired partially partially by kind of joining Carrie and kind of talking to people in Carrie. The other piece of this that was really interesting and, and partially kind of how I tried to uh, justify it to my very not music and art uh, uh, oriented department was that if you can take someone who's you know a, a normal healthy student and take that person to a professional singing level then can you take someone who's unhealthy someone who's have breathing dysfunction and bring them back to a healthy level so using right. kind of the same sorts of methods right. uh, so and that would be hugely beneficial if something that you don't need extra drugs for you know you don't have to change your your biochemistry it could be something that maybe you could do at home you know right. can we develop the uh device and the techniques so that someone could go home and kind of basically increase their breathing capacity improve their breathing behavior so that's something we're working on kind of an NIH proposal now to try and, and start doing that as well um but I think understanding kind of this breathing behavior in general and how we can take advantage of what clearly vocal professors have been doing for a very very long time and quantifying that and kind of expanding the utility of that beyond just maybe the vocal profession. Yeah, so interesting. Like I'm thinking about people who have had surgery and have had to be intubated. You know, they always give you that breathing thing where you have to mm -hmm. think of like how this could change like that experience and people with beginning stages of COPD and asthma. And just like how many different things there are out there, even recovering from like pneumonia and bronchitis can be so challenging because, because breathing is such an issue. And all of these people that have long COVID and mm -hmm. lung issues with that, like there's just such, there there's such a diverse demographic of people that this could really improve their quality of life. I, I just think that's, there's just so much out there. Um, I think that one of my curiosities is, I think when we first talked, you were telling me about, you know, just like the, the specific measures of breathing for singing and breathing for vocal training. And I guess one of my questions is like, can you talk a little bit about the science of measuring for breathing for, for voice? And um, how is that different from the way that we normal breathe, normally breathe? Like I, I understand on a really, really broad level that the breathing is different, just like my breathing is different if I'm running or I'm going upstairs or things like that. But like, can you describe to us how that breathing is different and why it's been, why breathing for voice would be beneficial as a, as a model or a framework for this? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll start off saying that I'm definitely not the expert in this. I've learned a lot from kind of the vocal collaborators. But I think the, the biggest example I could give you, um, so I, I first started talking to them about this project shortly after my first daughter was born. And they would ask them, you know, how, what does it look like when a singer, someone who's a professional singer, vocal, prof vocal professional breathes versus, you know, how I breathe. And I'd say it was a very uncomfortable lunch because they started pointing a seed, they're doing that, and that's how you breathe. And they're like, like, okay, no, I, I didn't realize I was breathing wrong the whole time. Um, but they, they mentioned that if you look at a, a newborn or an infant, the way that they breathe is they, at, like when they're asleep, for example, their stomach will go up and down. And then if you look at an adult, your chest goes up and down. And that you're supposed to be breathing with your with your your lower abdomen, not your upper abdomen. That's where you can kind of get the most of your of your breathing, your the best lung capacity and kind of the best behavior. and Somehow, uh, you know, the the question of you know how do we 
how does this help us understand kind of like people in general? Why? When does that happen? How? Why does that happen? Right. They, they, they're, I asked them that, and like, you know, you're socialized to, to breathe with your chest, which yeah. when I think of something being socialized, I think of like, you know, your teacher telling you that, you know, girls aren't good at math and, and boys aren't good at, you know, being emotional or something like that's what I think of being socialized, which is not good. But I don't remember anyone ever telling me like, you're breathing with your stomach. Like, that's bad. Breathe more with your chest. Like, and I, if I look and now I have, I have two daughters and my, my seven month old definitely breathes with her stomach. And my two-year-old is already breathing with her chest. Like something happened. And like, I never said anything. No one ever talked about that. Like, how does that happen? And that what my understanding is that basically the vocal, um, a lot of the vocal training is kind of going back to how you're supposed to be, how you kind of started as a human <laughs> of, you know, breathing with, with your lower abdomen, that there's more space there, you know, that it's, it, you can get more, more air, more oxygen, more into your lungs by using that part of your anatomy. But if we're breathing, we're just always doing it with our chest. And then, I mean, this is under your rib cage. There's only so much space up here. So that my being able to figure out, and there's a lot of things like you know, if your posture, how do you maximize volume that your lungs can kind of take up? But then there's different parts of you that can handle breath differently. And again, like, I, when I talk to a lot of arts and people kind of through Carrie, for example, they're very still focused, you know, they talk a lot about the art things and things I don't necessarily understand. And I learned a lot from them. It was the first time I went to an art professor and they started taking, teaching me a lot more about the science. I was like, oh, you know, way more about anatomy than I ever would have, would have. and they talk about yeah. the, the muscle names and all that. Um, so that's kind of really what I, I got out of that is, you know, how do you, how do you maximize the volume of your lungs essentially? Right. And the way to do that is to control your abdomen, control the volume, control the space that your lungs take up. And you don't really think about that. I mean, if you're hunched over, I mean, that's, you're contracting, or if you are, you're anything, you, you want to be very uh, over your center, you know, uh, things that maybe sound kind of like yoga-ish, you know, being very <laughs> centered and being kind of like aligned and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it was really interesting that for whatever reason, we, I would have thought that we just always start chest breathing because I mean, that's easy. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know why, but the fact that we start the kind of correct breathing or the breathing that isn't, I say, most optimal, and for some reason, kind of switch out of that. I'd wonder if, when you talk about running and walking, I'd wonder if there is something about how, like the, the chemistry or kind of how oxygen transfers. Then maybe there's something that's easier about, like it's more efficient or something when you have to do it really quickly that kind of takes advantage of maybe the more chest breathing. But I don't know that I've ever seen anyone actually try and, and study that. Um, yeah. and what kind of that biochemistry looks like. But it is, I, I mean, I literally, when they tell me that I went home and my daughter fell asleep and was like, they are correct. Like she is doing the thing that she is better at breathing than I am essentially. And she has been around for a few months and I have been around for much longer than that. So that's, that was just wild to me that that was something that really was important for this kind of vocal and, and all of that. I mean, they they had mentioned that they had, like, had a colleague who had some sort of uh, breathing illness and was able to overcome it, like had something that would have set back, you know, someone who didn't have this training significantly. Like breathing just would have been a challenge for the rest of their life. And because this person had this training, not only were they able to overcome this setback, but they were still singing professionally. <laughs> so wow. they were still singing better than I could. And they were still breathing yeah. better than I could even though they had, you know, parts of their lungs weren't working. And it just seems like such a powerful thing to tap into. Like, yeah, I'm glad that, you know, I love Broadway. I'm glad that people can sing, like, that's great. But how tapping that into people who, there's so much, you know, pharmacokinetics and, and you know, people trying to understand new drugs and it's always hard and things don't work the way you're supposed to and people don't always take them the way they're supposed to. If it was just saying, I think of, and when I say just, it's not easy. I mean, people come and they major in these things, right? Like there are people whose jobs are to train it. So I don't want to minimize that at all. But harnessing that instead of having to change something about your biochemistry just seems such like a powerful tool to get people able to breathe more optimally again. Yeah. I don't know. I just think so much. Like I know when my kid was really little, he had terrible asthma for like two years. His first two or three years and, and we always had to do like breathing treatments and you know um lots and lots of albuterol <laughs> you know and I remember reading 
a lot because academics attack their problems and solve their trauma through research a lot of the time. Um, I remember reading a lot about how um, when you hold your child close to you, um, like there, there is some biofeedback that happens between you and your child. And, and um, there, there had been some studies I remember um, about just even like breathing, normalizing by being close, you know, be, be being held and being close. Mm -hmm. And, and I find that really fascinating. The idea that we're socializing just by having like contact mm -hmm. um, with our infants. Right. And it doesn't require you to be the biological parent. It just requires you to be a, a human that is close and holding mm -hmm. right there's so many other things that happen in our brain development that control our our systems through that that biofeedback that we get from being held close it's fascinating um but you know to your point of like how do we learn how to chest breathe we we, we pass on a bad habit yeah. <laughs> you know um kind of like i don't know myriad other bad habits that we pass on to our kids accidentally <laughs> yeah and it makes it, I mean I guess because the the study couldn't really be done of like how do you have a kid who's never held <laughs> never kind of experiences that and then do they continue kind of doing you know belly breathing like that's a terrible experiment and that would never pass any IRB anywhere um but yeah. like is that is that what it what would that person be like like what would their breathing capacity what would their you know athletic capacity or your vocal capacity be if they never got that kind of that feedback mm -hmm. and like you, you think of all the things that you try to do that are good for your kids you know holding them close is like well even that like right like I can't do anything right as a parent <laughs> even that's gonna go to problem. yeah yeah wow I mean there's just so much that this leads into my last question which is a very humanities based question we've got um you know in humanities conversations uh they can they're very different from science conversations sometimes although they they are often on scientific topics humanities folks really like to take like the science and ask the big picture questions about them about how how does this make us human or how does this apply to being human or you know um how does this impact us right um the, any number of questions that Donna went, Donna Haraway asks applied to your work. Um, so I have the question. Um, I'm intrigued by the idea of considering wearable devices as a humanistic pursuit, um, something that allows us to develop um, a relationship with our bodies and to understand ourselves on a new level. Uh, how do you think a wearable device changes our perception of what it means to be human um, or to know ourselves as human? And what kinds of impacts do you think devices have had? And what kinds of ideas do you have for the future impact of wear wearable devices on our understanding of what it is to be human? Yeah, the the big question is that you know I like the the big question yeah I mean I think that one one take on that and I don't know if this is really getting at what you're what you're asking but I think that especially with all the AI in the the news right now and and we think of when we think of robots and and science fiction you know there's there's AI which is these computers that just kind of exist in the ether robots are maybe this physical manifestation of that but certainly when you look at sci-fi, the next step closer to humans is you know, the bionic people, right? You know, people who have replaced their legs or arms or limbs or, or uh, organs or something with, with robotic parts. But if we get to the point of kind of wearable sensors where you are, like, can you just be broken down to a series of numbers? Like your, like your, your movement, your, I mean, certainly the type of things I do are movement and, and, and position and things like that. But, you know, everything about, you know, your biochemistry, you know, your, your, if if you if you can be put into a computer it's just like a running set of numbers like what does that actually mean like how did, that's like that's that file is you or that file was you yesterday I can track all of your movement 
I can track all of your brain signals. I can track kind of your eye movement. I can track kind of your electrical impulses. I can like that's we're get, certainly getting to the point where we can really quantify using kind of wearable and I'll say implantable devices as well, kind of really quantify a lot of kind of just who you are. But then what does that mean to be who you are, right? I mean, just the electrical impulses doesn't say we were certainly not there. Like, what are you thinking? Um, there's all kinds of interesting stuff now of um, being, and if, if you've seen these kind of wearable sensors, you can you can wear them and based on your brain impulses, you can control like the movement of things. Um, they're actually at the museum in Huntsville, they have an example of this where you can kind of play, it's, it's like a toy version of it. And certainly it's not, Perfect. And there's a there's a professor at UA who's working on, on doing something like this. But like we can do a really good job of, of at least picking up these signals. So like where where I feel like it kind of blurs that line between, you know, there's right. it's like there's human and there's robot. But like if you can be numbers, if we can just say you are a series of numbers, like, but you're not, right? I mean, you're you're you say, yeah. you're human. And I, I, I and in science and engineering, it's much easier to deal with a series of numbers. If you were a series of numbers, we could we could cure everything, like we could treat everything, everything would be would be perfect, and, and you're not. Um, I mean, certainly one of the things that comes up a lot in research is I can uh, I teach health I teach health and safety. And, you know, you can take all the fluid mechanics and all the reactor design and all of that, and everything works perfectly, and then you put a person into it, and everything falls apart. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, people are always going to be kind of this really different animal, right. but sensors are kind of really just more and more kind of quant I mean the breathing right is quantifying something that previously was something that really had to be experienced um I think that's that's really interesting and I suppose also there's the um aid aspect of a lot of these sensors so it's not just what your status is but what can we do to kind of change that status so then the glucose monitor is a really good example of like you we can register your glucose and we can like basically just immediately give you insulin but there are also examples, I mean, this is kind of all, maybe I always go back to the robots, is that if, I, if I'm wearing a sensor and I can tell that I'm standing and I want to jump, and it is trained that when I put this amount of force onto the sensor, it is going to give me feedback of twice that amount of force. So I can jump higher. I can run faster. I can be right. stronger. You know, I, I, Iron Man is in the future, but it is not inconceivable to have kind of these Devices that can tell basically what you're trying to do and amplify that. Right. And that's that's just kind of kind of nuts. And you know, whether it's military or athletics or things like that, and it all really comes down to sensors. Because if you, I, I'm working on a, on a with a group or on a project now that's trying to look at kind of um, like constructive construction workers, where there's a lot of labor, really labor intensive tasks. That you have to pick something up. Uh, it goes along with nurses as well, where you might have these kind of smaller people who still need to pick up. Doesn't matter how big your patient is, you need to be able to move them off the bed or whatever. And be really useful to kind of give that person basically extra strength beyond what they could normally do. But there are devices that try to do that now, and because they can't sense where you are and kind of what your force is now, they tend to give too much, or they give it in the wrong direction and ends up hurting you or kind of making you extra tired. So these sensors are really going to enable all these kind of additive and kind of things on top of what you can normally do, which is really cool and really exciting. But then, you know, again, it kind of blurs the line maybe somewhere there. If, are you numbers? Where Where is the human to the bionic to robot kind of thing? And um, there, the other, I guess the other piece of that also is what does these sensors mean to be human? But when we make a lot of these sensors, we're not doing them in a vacuum. We're really oftentimes trying to mimic what the body can do. <laughs> like when skin, your skin, your nose is an amazing biosensor. We can't make anything nearly as good as your nose. Like just at picking things up and your tongue is a sensor, your skin is a sensor, you know, your hands and your feet. Everything we're doing is really trying to just get as good as we are. But then we take those sensors and we put them on robots. Not only are we kind of putting sensors on us and kind of making us a lot into kind of numbers and data, we're trying to get robots to be more like us. So having a robot that has skin that can uh, respond to and understand the environment that can balance itself better because then it has sensors on the bottom of kind of the feet and, and we can make you know may, just going to kind of animals birds that can sense air better or robots that can sense air better like birds so that they can use less power and we're really trying to use these sensors not just to kind of quantify us but to make robots more like us so I think that's an interesting question maybe as well as you know again blurring that line of uh, 
human robot sensor, you know, it is an interesting world. I suppose. Yeah. I mean, it's really age old, cool. right? We've got, we've got stories and stories and stories about the, you know, the, the blurred line between robots and cyborgs and humans. Um, we've been watching Doctor Who with with our nine-year-old and, you know, the whole cyborg um, storyline or sub subplot uh, comes to mind where you have, a, you know, all of the human intellect with all of the emotion stripped out of it. And, and is that still human? Like if you remove the emotion out of it, is it still human? And I think um, I th those are really fascinating um, questions to ask when we, when we have these, because obviously the devices that you're working on have nothing to do with um, altering the emotions, but but certainly they can monitor and leverage emotional mm -hmm. response, right? And um, it makes me think of your Android's dream of electric sheep and and that kind of stuff, where if they if they it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, you know, at some point, is it just a duck? <laughs> like, yeah. 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 It definitely, said, we're, we're not there yet. And I don't think my, uh, I don't know what the timeline is, but uh, definitely science is moving in that direction for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I have a sister who's a paramedic and she certainly could use some of that, you know, extra strength. She, uh, so she she has to she has a similar build to mine and you know lifting stretchers and you get hurt really easily yeah. people, people especially people who are you know paramedics and, and nurses and they're not going to say oh you're big and I'm small so I can't pick you up like they're going to do it anyway mm -hmm. but then you know nurses have horrible back problems and, and, and things like that and how can we take these people who are putting their bodies on the line and make things better for them? Absolutely. This has been so much fun, Amanda. I just want to talk forever. Um, <laughs> but we're coming to time. And I was wondering if you have any questions for me as we wrap this conversation up. I think in talking to you, I think I've better gotten a better understanding of what humanities means, I suppose. Because I feel like Humanities was a class I took in junior high that really meant English and social studies. So like, yeah. what, is, what is humanities? What is digital humanities? I appreciate kind of getting the chance to, I mean, again, there's this last question of like, what does it mean to be human? I, I think I don't think about stuff like that very often. And, but I do read a lot of science fiction, which I think does often ask, you know, what does it mean to be human? Uh, yeah. So I don't yeah. know that I have a question, but I think I, you, you've given me a lot to think about kind of just in time. Yeah. I have I have a lot more that I want to chat with you about <laughs> informally not being recorded um but as far as just like the crossover between those things like because I read a lot of science fiction too and I read a lot of like post-human theory and you know just the fun questions of like where are where are the lines between um human and not human like, how do we define that from like post-structuralist ideas? Like when you pull things apart and really start trying to categorize them, like how you, how can you find a stable category that is that is human? What does that mean, right? So yeah, more conversations to come, but I just appreciate your time so much. This has been so lovely and I think so many people are going to enjoy listening to your talk today and just thinking about all of these things especially you know a lot of humanities folks are super we get super curious when we start hearing scientists talk about stuff like this so um thank you for for offering your time to um, feed us with some fun ideas <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for talking to me as well. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. And this has been great. Uh, and I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>